that. You, I think we heard that you were a small town boy from Alabama. Yeah. That's what you said. And yeah. your dad worked at a sawmill and then you cut out. So maybe yes. I'll let you take it from there. All right. My, my grandfather had a stroke and that's why I went, went into neurology and he, and he was my best buddy. And so uh, I decided I wanted to help stroke patients to start with. And then it wound up uh, that I really, really enjoyed um, in med school, neurologic patients, patients that had neurologic conditions and their caregivers. And that's what I went into. And I'm glad I did for many reasons, but one of those reasons is because my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease after I became a neurologist in practice. And and in do that's what that's what sort of set me off on the road that I'm on right now. Uh, this road yeah. of advocacy. So um there we that's go. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we all have our own little stories that change change sort of our our path, but it's kind of interesting to reflect, but that's interesting about your granddad too. So you really have had, have, have had a longstanding respect for the brain and you know, what, what happens to it. And it's, it's sweet that you also were so close to your granddad. Cause I think it shows in the work that you've done in your, in your, in sort of um, some connecting uh, multi-generation. So, so maybe I'll let you um, start your slideshow and, and we'll learn Absolutely. about it. And if uh, there's any other glitches, hopefully people can bear with us. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, weather and other things happening in the world. So, right. So sorry about that. So what I'm going to do uh, with everyone is I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint that I've got together for you. And hopefully this will um, give you a little bit of uh, a better story about um, uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to try to go to my... Um, if you just click on slideshow at the top. Slideshow. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hidden. It's, it's, so I'm, I'm, it's I'm at the top. Uh, can you see it? Uh, see yeah, it. there. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I was hidden. Yeah, good yeah, deal. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Can y'all see that? I hope. Yep. Perfect. Very good. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, first of all, about my dad, because the reason I'm doing what I'm doing right now is really dad and mother and people who are living with neurologic diseases and their care partners. So um, my dad was a, was a sawmiller. Uh, we did not know he had any artistic talent. Uh, he was not a very aesthetic type of person. Uh, he, was, he was a getter, getter done. You know, he was about building things and sawing things, and he was in the woods a lot. But after dad got Alzheimer's disease or was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, he um, became depressed. Uh, he was a very uh, facile man. He, he, he could do a lot with his hands. He had good verbal skills and he began to lose some of that. And it was depressing to him. And uh, dad enrolled in an adult dementia daycare program in our town called Caring Days. And once he went to Caring Days, he was exposed to expressive arts, uh, not only um, visual art, but also music therapy, um, some dance and movement, uh, some poetry and, and drama and those sorts of things. And he really blossomed. And, and I, I can remember my mother saying, Lester's not going to do any of that uh, because he had never been someone who was interested in that. But dad met an, met an art teacher named George Parker. George was not an art therapist, but he was a retired artist uh, who just had a knack for knowing how to share his art. And so dad was one of the first people there who partook of George's art program. And the, the main modality was watercolor. Um, initially, George um, showed uh, the clients pictures, uh, uh, whether they be paintings that he had done or photographs, um, and, and put them up for them to see those, and then let them draw them with pencil and then paint them. But eventually, uh, people began to just paint de novo from and so some of the early works that dad did were things that he had looked at and drawn, but most of the works that are very, very powerful for us are those that he painted from memory. And I'm, I'm going to show you some of these amazing things. What you'll see is that dad's life story was coming out through the art at a time when he could not tell us his life story any longer because he had aphasia, so he had language difficulties. But he was able to access those remote memories from early childhood, including the relationships and the places. And he was able to share those with us. Some of our favorites, the little hummingbird in the right lower corner, 
was his first painting. And he brought that home and mother said, Lester, who gave you that beautiful painting? He said, I did it myself. He was so proud. And this was at a time when he knew that he had lost some of his faculties. And so he was um, having a hard time dealing with that, as was I, by the way. As a neurologist, I felt that I should have had him diagnosed sooner. I felt that I should be able to advise my mother better about what to do day to day when things come up. They didn't teach that and do in neurology school. So I, I had to learn a lot of the caregiving, care partnership things later. But dad brought home the art and it gave him a new lease on life. So I want to show you some, some very interesting things about dad's art. Now, this is dad in the top left corner. He used to make bird houses, uh, enjoy doing woodworking for people in the community. He would give those away, go to people's yards and put them up in his retirement. Um, I want you to look at, uh, there's a birdhouse. I want you to look at some of dad's late dementia art. You can see a birdhouse mowing up in his art. And dad didn't tell us what this was, but we knew that he was still building birdhouses just like he had been doing in, in his art. You can see another one in this blue painting uh, there. This was, a, this was something that was very important. Dad always loved fences. Uh, he built fences. I helped him repair fences. He just liked fences. You can see dad in about 1936 with his family on the far left, lower left corner in front of the old home place with the fence. And he used to talk about that fence. And you can see some other fences that dad painted, watercolor fences, uh, after he got the diagnosis. I absolutely love this story, this little vignette. Uh, because these two guys, my dad on the left and Albert Corder on the right, uh, sawmilled together, were best buddies growing up. Albert was dad, but they were very, uh, very close friends all of, all of their lives. And um, I got to see that friendship as a, as a young man before Mr. Albert passed away. And it really was a model for me uh, of a friendship. And uh, they had worked together from very, very early on. Mr. Albert helped to raise my dad. And late in dad's life, one of the, one of the later paintings, moderate, moderate Alzheimer's disease, I would say, is this watercolor of an African-American man and a Caucasian man pulling a crosscut saw. And um, I asked dad, I knew who that was. And I asked dad, I said, who's that? And he just put his hand on Albert. And I said, dad, Mr. Albert, and he cried. It was Mr. Albert that was still pulling a saw with dad after all these years in dad's mind, in dad's spirit, very deep. So this, among other things, has taught me that powerful relationships uh, continue to be present in someone's long-term memory and continue to be drawn upon as we get older. And I think uh, pulling a saw with Albert was a source of comfort for my father. So that's a very, very powerful image for me and many others that have seen it. Likewise, this is my dad's dad. Uh, this was Lester Sr. And you can see him back in the 20s in a, in a carriage up top there. And you can see a high top shoes and a hat. A big daddy, I called him big daddy. He always had a hat. And he always had these high top brogans on. Dad would have pulled up on those high top shoes as a little boy crawling around on the floor. Um, there's a birdhouse and there's a cross cut saw like the kind that they used in the sawmill. Dad's best known, and by the way, this is a picture of me, dad, and my grandfather at his father's grave. His father died in 1896. And um, big dad. I think we had another freezing episode. So here is dad's oh. best known painting, or it's the time when dad couldn't talk anymore. Uh, he brought home this. I want to show you some things about this painting. You probably can see that that looks like an upside down cross cut saw with a handle on it. You may be able to see that that is a cross with a hat on it and that that is a high top shoe. And so in abstract, this is my father's father. And I tell you what, I still get emotional when I look at this because this was at a time, like I said, when dad couldn't communicate very well with us. But I believe this was a way that he could express his early life, that he could be with his father again, and that he could provide himself some comfort during a very trying time. 
In addition, this is a fence, a birdhouse, and some leaves and rocks. So this is kind of a this is kind of a painting of dad's life story. So I love the blue collage, we call it. Um, and, and Indu, I don't know if you want me to go through this whole thing and stop and, or, or stop and, and uh, talk a, a little bit, discuss some things. We can do it either way you want to do it. Yeah, why don't you keep going? I think it's okay. fine. Okay. So um, we were so incredibly um, amazed at what was happening because I didn't, don't, I didn't know much about this uh, at that time. I didn't know much about the expressive arts. I had a music minor in college because I sing. So I, had, was a vo I was a voice minor, but I really didn't know about its use with people with neurologic disease. But after dad passed away, I met an art therapist named Angel Duncan. Now, Angel has worked with the Alzheimer's Association, the Alzheimer's Foundation. She's done research uh, and she's now in Florida and has taught, it, uh, uh, has, has taught up in the Northeast. Um, Angel heard about dad's story and she actually came to Alabama because she wanted to see some of the art and, and talk. Out of that meeting and that education that I got from an art therapist who had worked with people with dementia, by the way, she, she was at UCSF in, in California to work with Dr. Bruce Miller, who is, who is a, a very well known in this area. But um, she said, you know, there may be a possibility we could do a program that we could, we could take your dad's story and, and utilize it to create a program. So I began to think on that, talk to my family about it. And so we did, we started a foundation called Cognitive Dynamics. And the mission of that foundation, as you can see, was to bring the expressive arts to people living with dementia of any cause and their care partners, and also help preserve their stories and uh, use it as a model for educating students. And so we started our foundation in 2010 and uh, we've done programming since that time. And I'll talk about that at the end of this PowerPoint. But I learned a lot about the use of the arts. And one thing I learned is that we don't need to call therapy something that's not therapy. Um, and, and I didn't know that at the time. I think uh, expressive arts therapists like music therapists, art therapists, dance therapists, et cetera, um, have been trained uh, as therapists uh, using the modalities of the various expressive arts that they use so that there's a client uh, relationship with a practitioner, there are outcomes, and there are specific therapy therapeutic tools that they use. However, I don't want to detract from the use of art uh, in any therapeutic way uh, as a wellness uh, for people who have neurologic disease, because remember, that's what dad had. He did not have therapy. And so um, the, the, the terms that have been coined there, arts and healthcare is a term that is, is, is used to describe um, artists and others using um, the expressive arts uh, for sort of wellness uh, promoting um, paradigms. And then arts therapies are people who have been trained in, in the therapies. So I, I wanted to make that distinction to start with. You know, Art has a lot of benefits on the brain, and I've listed some of them here, and we can talk a little bit about this. One of the things that art does, and I'm talking about not, no, not only visual art, but other kinds of art as well, it facilitates the development and preservation of visual, spatial, and fine motor skills, things that, that, are, that are very tough as we have certain conditions like Parkinson's. Um, it increases one's ability to create abstractions and to think abstractly about things. Um, it helps to lessen the effects of stress on the brain. And there have been a lot of studies showing that cortisol, one of the stress hormones, goes down in people that are engaged in art making. And, uh, and, and it also helps preserve patience and, and sustain our attention and ability to regulate emotions. It makes connections between unrelated things. It helps us to navigate problems even that may arise in the future. It actually develops a part of the brain which is used for planning and um, being prepared for um, things that we may encounter in the future that may be stressful. It activates the pleasure center or our reward center in the brain and it engenders a flow state, that state that we get into that is very good for our brains when we lose the concept of time. We're so into something uh, that that we don't know we don't know what else is going on. Um, these are some of the benefits. Now, this I, I think this is a this is a really pretty slide. It's an artistic picture of the brain, 
And I wanted to highlight some of the areas that are involved in art making or art viewing, um, creativity in general. And guess what? I had to highlight all of them because they all are involved from the frontal cortex, which is involved in planning the art, uh, art making, to the subthalamic nucleus and basal ganglia that are involved in some of the, the, the motor processes that cause us to create the motor cortex, the parietal lobe, which pulls, pulls in all of the sensory information that comes in and helps us to tie it into memory and vision, the visual cortex. I mean, literally every part of the brain is involved in art making, even if we use therapeutic um, smells or olfactory um, uh, sensory stimuli, even the olfactory part of the brain. So uh, art, is, art, is, art is good for the brain. Music is good for the brain. I'm talking any kind of art. So it, it, it really, um, it, it, it helps to bypass areas that are not working so well. For my dad, his language function was not working well. And he had a hard time laying down new memories into long-term memory because his hippocampus, the, the save button for the brain was not working well. But it helped dad draw out old memories and his, his story came out. Um, there have been some randomized control trials of art therapy showing that it helps behavioral, social, cognitive, and emotional problems in people that are living with dementia. Um, it also can help, and this is, we found this to be very important. It helps people to process traumatic events that may have happened earlier in life, uh, traum traumatic memories, and, and, and to turn them in many ways positive. Uh, and, and we've seen this happen in individual art therapy sessions, but also over the course of a semester, where a recurrent theme that someone may talk about during their art making, maybe someone's death or maybe a challenging time from childhood, actually is rewritten into a story that is more positive at the end of the therapy sessions, which is really an incredible thing. And I'm hoping, I don't know this to be true, but I'm hoping that it does the same thing for somebody's diagnosis if they have this diagnosis that they have a hard time dealing with, I hope that the expressive arts can help them rewrite that story and, and to, to turn things somewhat positive and, and find meaning uh, where they may not have been able to find it before. It can diminish apathy, improve quality of life measures. Um, it can actually improve mental competency, mental acuity, social ability, and calmness and even viewing art in programs like the Meet Me at MoMA program, the, the art gallery, um, uh, docent-led art gallery programs across the country where people can go with their care partners and, and view art and then perhaps create art afterwards. Uh, these have been associated with elevated mood and, and improved self-esteem and quality of life measures. So just viewing art uh, can be effective. Why is art therapy and, and expressive arts, why are they effective in people with dementia? Well, one thing they do is they, they rely on preserved abilities rather than uh, trying to correct disabilities. Uh, so we work with what, what's there. Um, they provide a vehicle for emotional expression. They can engender this flow state that we talk about. They build community. Um, uh, you know, conditions can be isolating. Well, the various expressive arts build community and give people a sense of ownership and belonging, and they can help someone overcome apathy and hope, hopelessness and bring someone into the present moment. Uh, so uh, mindfulness is, is, is very important as well. In the last part of this PowerPoint, and then we'll, we can, we can uh, discuss and, and, and open it up, I wanted to tell you about a program that we created in dad's memory and by his inspiration called Bringing Art to Life. Bringing Art to Life um, is meant to facilitate a dignifying experience for people living with uh, various kinds of dementia and their families, uh, to preserve their life stories, to educate students about dementia, including person-centered care, to facilitate those intergenerational relationships and communication and empathy that we were talking about a minute ago, and then to showcase life stories and artistic accomplishments of people if they feel comfortable doing with that. Doing that. We, we have a foundational creed for our program, and that is what you see here. 
Each person has innate value and dignity, despite conditions or circumstances. Personhood is inherent and unfading, despite any ability of ours to perceive it. So we have to go into this believing that a person is there, that we can reach that person and have a relationship with them, and that the disease does not define them, because the human person is bigger than that. And we go into that and we think about that every day. Uh, we train our students, which, by the way, can be high school students, college students, medical students, et cetera, um, a little bit about dementia. We have them uh, go through the virtual dementia tour and also a virtual reality dementia experience from Embodied Labs. And Embodied Labs has uh, dementia modules that allow you to experience first person what it's like to have Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, stroke, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And they continue to develop modules, and they're quite amazing. Um, and so we go through that, and the students go through that um, so that they can gain empathy. Angel Duncan and other art therapists uh, teach about art therapy. Let's give them some background on that. We do practice mindfulness, and we learn about mindfulness. As a matter of fact, we start our therapy sessions with mindfulness activities so that we can center on the present moment, non-judgmentally, and begin to engage all our senses to listen and be open uh, for this activity. So we find that to be very helpful. Um, and I'll tell you, the students today, Indu, I'm, I'm sure uh, you've seen this too, the students today need to practice mindfulness. They, they re the ones that continue doing it, and I hear back from them all the time, I said, thank goodness we talked about that because it's very stressful to be a college student. <laughs> a college student. But uh, we certainly do that. We also want to have first person experience, uh, experiences, accounts of dementia for the students. And so we invite people living with dementia uh, who feel comfortable doing so to come and talk to and interact with our, with our students. And so we, we see two of our friends here, the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hewling Hummel from New York and Brian LeBlanc from Florida, both of whom are living with early onset Alzheimer's disease and who are very uh, active advocates, we have them come and talk to our, our kids. Cynthia Hewling Hummel has made these masks that she um, has depicted what it's like to live with Alzheimer's disease. And so she has a story behind each of them. And as you can see, Brian over here, we're at a coffee shop at a memory cafe where he says, I have Alzheimer's, but it doesn't have me. And so they, they talk to our students and our students enjoy interacting with those folks. Of course, we have music, live music, and these, these folks even let me join in. So I'm up there joining some of the, we have all kind of bluegrass, blues, jazz, um, et cetera. And then we preserve memories in, uh, in a life story book we call uh, a life legacy book from lifebio.com. And so we upload their art, we upload letters from the family, the students write poetry, write letters to the person, life stories, we put all that memorabilia in there and we have a final celebratory dinner where we give them this and the students get up and it's very touching because the students get up and tell how their life has been impacted by this individual. And we tell their whole family. Uh, and then some of the kids just are very, they really let it all out and say, listen, you have taught me so much. I'm a better person because I've known you. And it's a very validating uh, situation. The art that comes out is, is, is really amazing. And this is some, these are some of the works that have come out. Um, and we literally, we have, we have anything from traumatic brain injury to Parkinson's, Lewy body, frontotemporal, uh, early onset Alzheimer's, um, uh, Parkinson's related to dementia, related dementias, et cetera. We have a quite a, a big variety of, of folks that come through the program. We have done some research on the program about, about to be done with the PowerPoint here. And I'll just point out a couple of things about this research. Um, on the student side of things, it improves empathy, it improves attitudes toward older adults and towards people with dementia. Um, it, it, it creates an existential awareness uh, through mindfulness and empathy training, and it improves engagement with the present moment. And we know that on the student side. Uh, we know that it also, um, uh, uh, people uh, with dementia, uh, enjoyment, they enjoy this. Their caregivers say that at home, they are more interactive. Their communication improves. And there is caregiver respite uh, built into this. We found that morning sessions work better. We found that engagements over verbal and social interactions were more uh, uh, prevalent than art engagements. So in other words, the relationships that are built seem to be more important than the art making, which is interesting. 
And uh, the reminiscence that occurs when someone is painting is usually about personhood or family ties or early relationships. We've been fortunate to take the program out of Alabama to Chicago with my friend, Dr. Neelam Agarwal at Rush University. And we use high school students there in a, uh, a, um, an assisted living facility, Chicago Methodist Senior Services. Uh, we also take the program to Birmingham, Alabama and work with a, um, an adult daycare there and with a small liberal arts college, Birmingham Southern College. And out of the program has come a memory cafe and a one-on-one a -on -one outreach program where kids go to homes of people living with dementia and do art activities there. Um, so of course, COVID has been challenging. And uh, as you might, uh, as you might uh, understand, because our adult day programs have not been open, but we've continued to reach out to people virtually offering art activities via Zoom, uh, FaceTiming, writing letters to folks, sending art kits out and that sort of thing. Kids have made videos, music videos, et cetera. And I will end this PowerPoint with this because it's one of the most powerful stories, stories that has come out of our program. Um, this was Miss Katie. Uh, she was a very sweet uh, community leader um, who had spent her life um, uh, taking care of people uh, who really, really needed it and helping uh, young people to learn how to do the same. Uh, Miss Katie had Parkinson's disease and she had concerns about whether or not she would be able to do uh, the art activities. So um, it was um, determined by her student partners and Miss Katie that she wanted to try them holding her hand and helping to steady her while she did the art, but she also wanted to try holding their hands and guiding them through the art activity. So they did a little bit of both all semester. And by the end of the semester, they do all do a collaborative project together. And so their collaborative project was this pink and yellow painting with everybody's hand. So they traced everybody's hand. Miss Katie's was in the middle and they all painted it together. But I will never forget, and this, this five or six years ago, uh, those students still uh, email me and talk about how much it meant to spend time with Miss Katie. And I'm glad I have that picture because the picture's worth a thousand words. Um, so um, that, that, that does the PowerPoint and uh, I will um, stop sharing. By the way, we can share this PowerPoint uh, uh, with the group, if we'd like to do that, no problem with that at all. But anyway, that's that's what I wanted to tell you. That's so amazing, so touching. Wow, that's such a great initiative. Um, I mean, the things that I love about it, is, you know, I've told you are many. I think the intergenerational aspect of it is amazing. I think that teaching the next generation, you know, the younger generation, who I think are very wrapped up in often, we, we both have children, and we've talked about this a little bit too, you know, their, their own, you know, what, what is happening and on the computer all day long, I think for them to spend time, um, you know, learning respect, learning patience, learning um, really where they're from. I mean, I think it becomes sort of a thing where, I mean, you showing these pictures of your family, my parents are many, miles away. I haven't seen them in a year and a half, so I'm getting a little emotional, but um, I grew up with my grandmother too. And it was a, a beautiful thing to have in the home, you know, this sort of calming force as she got sicker, you know, you just see so much about life and you learn about life um, in a beautiful way. And I think that's what probably draws somebody like you and somebody like me to a field like you know, neurology, where we get to have these relationships with people and, you know, learn about their families and hold their hand. And, you know, a lot of that's missing these days, but, you know, I think that's sort of what the beauty of our fields are. So, um, but I think the intergenerational aspect is tremendous. And I think that growing that outside of just, you know, Alabama, we're probably, you know, it's a small enough town where everybody kind of knows each other. And probably there's most of this happening anyway, probably there, there, there's a little less disconnection maybe from family. Um, but I think, you know, the, the sort of concept of that has to be kind of still a, a priority of, I think, our communities, our society. And I think that that's been part of, you know, what's missing and what has led to, you know, my work and thinking about loneliness and social connection is that people just, you know, as they age, they tend to, you know, not want to burden people, sometimes tend to isolate, sometimes withdraw, and then they, there's sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy of, of sort of not having connection and then, you know, not getting into these sort of um, 
communities where where they can kind of preserve function and really you know look forward to things and and then you know i think a lot of the times people get more progressive um, and quicker in in terms of their disease um you know as, as sort of they isolate so so i do think that you know i, I think that's a beautiful aspect of things um i wanted to i think there's a lot of great comments here and it sounds like this has really been resonating with a lot of folks and people want to try to see if they can bring this to their communities and maybe we can talk about i mean obviously we can't clone uh, hundreds of you and and your beautiful program, uh, but I mean, if there's some, you know, cheap and cheaper, maybe you know, what what are some ways? Maybe if somebody's sitting at home with uh, their loved one, you know, and and people have been kind of, um, you know, isolated this year, uh, maybe it's some way to start. Like, what the, what do you put in the art kit? Maybe what would be some ways to start? You know, I like the idea of looking at photos and then finding inspiration from that, or maybe old family photos look like they've really resonated. So maybe just tell us, you know. Uh, a sort of a, a, a poor man's version or, or an isolated or, or, you know, not, not in your backyards man version of starting this. Right. Well, certainly um, I think we can all, so, so by the way, things that we're doing are combined with reminiscence, you know, they, they are, they, they, they just lead into that. So uh, one great thing to do, which I'm sure you, you probably all do is pull out the old photo album and, and, and talk about, uh, talk about family, uh, relationships and, 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 and important events uh, that rise to the, to the memory over the years and, and engage that. Um, looking at nature scenes um, is, is, is really good for our brains also. And there's been some, there have been some studies about that, you know, putting nature art in healthcare environments. And, uh, and it, it, it makes people feel better. And so if you can get a hold of some, uh, some, some pretty nature pictures and begin to look at those, with your with your family member that that's engaging. Um, I find even uh, learning photography. I mean, if it's not too difficult to to try to do taking some photos, it's a I've, I've so after Dad showed us his art, I, so I started writing poetry. Um, I did more singing. I've started playing the piano, and now I'm I'm a photographer, so I take a lot of photos. I've got thousands of nature photos, and so um, um, and but look, I get my my cell phone and just walk around the house in the morning. It's amazing that the, the light coming in the windows in the early morning and, and what, what it illuminates in the house. I mean, you can use a cell phone to take some gorgeous shots and there's some, some, some cheap apps that you can get to edit those. Those, for the people with the technical skills, that's important. But listen, you can get some, some paper and pencils, colored pencils, and begin with a hand tracing. I mean, you can, you can begin simply with a hand tracing and you let your loved one trace the hand or, or you trace it for them if they have a tough time doing it. And then once you get the hands traced, you can say, now, what's important to you? What are the things that are most important to you? And let, let's put those in or paint those in or write those in on the fingers. And, and, and then let's talk about things that, um, that, that your favorite day. And, and why don't we write that up above the hand? Um, we can do collage work at home. We can get a magazine and some scissors. We can pull out some things that you'd be amazed at what people are drawn to in a collage and, and, and put, those, uh, uh, put those down. We can do leaf work. We can collect leaves in the yard um, and we can trace those with, um, um, with uh, filter paper and stuff like that. We can even dye coffee filters and, and use, um, use uh, watercolor dye and, and dye coffee filters and glue them on a sheet of paper. I mean, there are so many things that you can use for uh, from stuff around the home. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned, Dan, Danny, that we we didn't learn this in neurology school, right? What did we learn? In <laughs> I mean, I like so just every day. I'm like, what the? I don't even know what I did for four years of my residency and four years of medical school. And I went to some really good places, you know, in two years of of uh, fellowship. But so, if you were to teach, let's say distill down let's say the the couple of you know golden points or you know pearls that you you have learned from this experience with your dad and you know wanted to teach a medical student let's say who's ready to or a neurology resident newly newly diagnosed newly formed you know all ready to go with their white coat what would be the couple of pearls that really you wish somebody had taught you you know when you were leaving school? well they're they're i'm so glad you asked that Indy, because they're really they're really important pearls and, and the first one is, you better know how to take care of yourself uh, before you start trying to take care of people long term. And, uh, and you know, I didn't, I didn't really know how to do that. 
And so uh, one of the things that dad taught me was, is that you know, I had to learn how to take care of myself and it was tough, but now I try to do that. And, and I try to do most of the things that we've talked about here. The second thing is, is that relationships are important and they continue to be important throughout your life. And so you have to, um, to um, value relationships. And, uh, and that's with your colleagues, that's with your family, your friends, and that's with your patients and care partners. Another thing is that the person is always there. Um, I remember uh, a poignant scene in, in uh, a movie about Glenn Campbell, which many of you may have seen, uh, when he was being asked questions in a mini mental status exam, uh, and he was not able to answer those questions. And exasperated at the end of it, he said, but I can play a guitar. In other words, I'm still Glenn Campbell. I can still play music. I still have work. Always learn to see the person beneath the disease and draw that out and believe that they're there. Another thing is you got to support care partners. You got to listen to care partners. Um, and so, and then the, the, the last thing is everything that you can do to develop empathy, you need to do it. And, um, and that means getting in contact, spending time with people who are living with conditions who don't have and who do not who do not look like you and may not be from the same social strata that you are it's important to do that you'll be a better rounded person a better physician a better provider that's amazing well i mean i think that you've embodied and i know we've talked about this because we we both are involved in trying to help break down the silos and try to really impact people in every community i mean i think that you know we we at the you know in neurology and all these sorts of areas are realizing that you know we we do a good job of helping affluent people of certain skin colors get better care, right? But we really are not reaching people and there's sometimes mistrust. And one of the things that I think has really, you know, been beautiful about your message and the pictures obviously is that you and your family have been so, it sounds like, um, you know, embody that sort of philosophy for, you know, generations. So how are you trying to, how do you include in a place? Cause I, I've never honestly been to Alabama. I'm Canadian as most people know, and also American, but I have never been to certain States. And like, I picture people, you know, being rather segregated, you know, historically and stuff like that. So how do we get these, you know, sort of multi, uh, multiple sort of diverse populations in the same room doing art together in some of these places? How do we really reach out to, into the community, build that trust and really, you know, those hands and holding those hands are of everyone, right? Not just, right, you know, right. a, a granddaughter and their grandpa. I mean, it's really, you know, getting the community together, right? So, so how do we well, do that? This is critically important. And, and I know you believe that. And, and I will not stand here and, and, and tell you that I'm, that I'm a, an expert or even a novice on knowing how to do that. Because, because the people who know how to do that are out there. And most of them don't look like me. Um, but I, but I, but I will say that uh, I think um, I think our I think our faith organizations play a big role. I mean, in the South, um, we had you know you know the role of faith and in, in spirituality and in, in people's uh, worship experiences are very important. I think the clergy uh, in many communities are leaders, even in terms of uh, of of, of health care uh, proportioning, education, and all of those things. I think we've got to get out in the communities and um, and volunteer. Um, I'm fortunate. My wife is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity here in our town, and we had a devastating tornado in Tuscaloosa in 2011. It killed over 60 people in town, and it wiped out a sixth of the city. And she became executive director soon after that. And they've built many, many habitat homes in that area. But one of the things that happens is, is that everybody in the community has come together. As a matter of fact, we've had people from all over the world in Tuscaloosa rebuilding and a community tragedy like that. So in Tuscaloosa, I will have to say, things have really come a long way because, because of, 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 of that community tragedy. So people are used to helping each other, but we've got to get young people out of the community, volunteering, getting close to people that don't look like them, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it will change you. It will change you. And then you'll want to do, you, you want to do better and you'll begin to see your own biases, your subcon your, your biases that even I, that I have, I see them all the time. I said, why did I think, why do I think that way? I got to do better. But I mean, those are some thoughts. Absolutely. Those are amazing. Um, you mentioned the flow state. And as you know, I think you and I are both kind of spiritual and out of the box kind of people. 
I don't know that we we didn't learn that in neurology training either, but I'm really interested in that sort of state. And, um, you know, also the sort of sense that people, you know, get into a place and kind of forget everything else that's going on and, you know, sort of like, and that I think is a really good state, right? Like that's state. So maybe tell me a little bit about that, you know, from your neurologist hat, um, help break that down. And how do we get more into that? You know, um, this, the, the, the hyper cognition that, that we, that we live in, the, the, the brain that's that's thinking three or four uh, ahead, you know, planning, thinking, obsessing, ruminating. I'm terrible with that. Uh, anxious and worried, um, living in the future or uh, remorseful for the past. That's not good for the brain. And you know, as you know, I mean, the the brain, uh, there, there, the the parts of the brain that are at work when we are creating or when we are practicing mindfulness, or when we are praying, or, or doing these other things, nature experience, etc., are the parts that um, uh, help to control the, quote, animal brain. So the, so, the, so the frontal parts of the brain that exert influence over the, um, the, the lower parts of the brain that may be more reactive, so the fight or flight parts of the brain, those are parts that are engaged when we are making art, when we're in this flow state, so that so that we gain top down, what's called top down control of some of the reactivity uh, and of some of the fear and of some of the addictive potential and, and, and that. Um, and, and those are developed by doing things like creating. And so I, the older I get, the more convinced I am that the more time we can spend in the moment, in the moment, the better off we are health wise. And there's plenty of evidence to show that, right? And do, I mean, uh, from your immune system to to your brain to to your emotions, it's better when we're in the moment. Absolutely. No, I think getting out of your head, they say, right? So getting out of that rumination. So people spend so much time thinking about, yeah, this uh, over and over and over. What's going to happen after this? And then what do, am I going to do this in 10 years or five years or whatever? But they're like missing what's right in front of them. And I even noticed that, and I'm I'm definitely guilty of this too, when you have a family member, you know, um, in front of you, um, you know, I have a 13 year old who's just sweet as pie and he's growing fast. He's taller than me. And, you know, I know that like in a year, I'm going to look back and be like, oh, that was, you know, COVID had him in my house all day long. He drives me nuts. But, you know, sometimes there's just these magical moments. And if I was, you know, wrapped up on my phone or something else, or, you know, thinking about something else, I would have missed that. So even with, I think, social connection, sometimes being in that flow state of a beautiful conversation or laughing with somebody or, or reminiscing about something. Something, you know, that kind of takes you away from all this other stuff. And so I think many of the things that you talked about with the, the sort of mind body connection kind of aspects, right? So we talk about mindfulness and people think it's so complex and you have to get, you know, a cushion and sit on a mat and for 20 minutes a day. But like, I think, you know, you mentioned nature. I think that's a, totally a way, you know, even photography stopping what, oh, this is a beautiful flower. Let me take a picture. And then looking at the beauty, right? Of yes. gratitude, um, you know, things like that, you know, just being present in right. whatever yeah. moment you know, the, the art and then coming home and maybe drawing it or, or, you know, uh, the leaves, I mean, so much beauty. So, I mean, I think you have so many fans over here. Um, one of the things that people, somebody's mentioned the Lincoln family, watercolor pencils have so many options to create design inspire with a simple paint box, pencil sharpener, and a few brushes, and of course, watercolor paper. So it sounds like there's relatively, you know, for 10 bucks, maybe at the art supply store or on Amazon or whatever, um, you could kind of walk out with a relatively simple, um, you know, maybe chalk, even if it's it's a nice day on the ground. I mean, I think you don't have to get too busy. Um, you know, people are talking about getting involved in landscaping, things that they never would have thought of. So I think it's pretty amazing, um, you know, all the things that we can do. I wanted to spend a minute talking a little bit about the concept of prayer, because I know that you are uh, a, a religious uh, man, and I also am religious in a different uh, sort of respect. Um, what, so when you, when you talk about these flow states, mindfulness, uh, you know, nature, and you mentioned prayer. How does prayer, do you think, influence the brain in a, in a similar way? When I think, you know, we're talking about, you know, belief, and then I guess, I mean, maybe define that a little bit more. I, I don't want to yeah. speak for what you're talking about, but maybe you could just a little bit about that. Well, you know, I think um, that um, a state of prayer, um, it, it, it engages many of the areas that we've talked about already that, that, that are engaged. Um, in, in, in art making. Um, I also think that uh, in, in today's environment, it's very hard to trust anything. 
And, uh, and I, find, I find in my experience that the people who uh, have trust or belief in something, some higher power, some, some, some good, some universal good, uh, God or, or whatever they trust in, that is transcendent and superlative, then, then it, it genders a state of health for them or wellness. Um, and, and, uh, and those that, that don't have anything to trust in, or if they only trust in themselves, um, the loss of control associated with chronic illness or even, even caregiving can devastate them. So it, it's, it's, you know, suffering can either, of course, you know, suffering can either transform you or, or kill you. You know, it, it's, 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 so it's the people that know how to bear that suffering into the presence of some higher power or higher entity that they trust and have faith in, I think do better. And there's some evidence to show that. And so um, those, are, those are some thoughts in, in terms of the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology of prayer. I think it's very similar to that of meditation or that of, that of art making or the flow state, my understanding. Yeah. I mean, I think that everyone has their own sense of what gives them peace. And sometimes they've sort of forgotten that. I think people get so wrapped up in, you know, what does Dr. Subramanian think I should be doing for five days a week for 30 minutes a day? And I'm like, you know, just you kind of know what that was, right? Like what, what brought you peace and joy maybe when you were in college or in those hard moments, you know, not with necessarily after the diagnosis of Parkinson's at this age or stage, but you know, when, when you were, you know, in, in other sort of situations, maybe throughout your life and you face adversity, I think it's important to realize and recognize that it's going to be very individual for each person and that you, you, have it within you to kind of connect with that. And I think sometimes people just don't trust that. And, and they sort of are looking for something outside for somebody to give them a prescription, right? As a doctor or whatever, to go and do this or, you know, to take this uh, three times a day or whatever. But sometimes I think these un, unwritten things that you and I never learned in, in medical school uh, to articulate, but I think we both embody um, to some degree, and we're still learning, right, um, are, are hugely powerful. And I think that we can't um, probably easily study them with science or, and a randomized control study. Uh, but, you know, I think they're, they're, they're pretty amazing. So, um, so maybe in the last couple of minutes, uh, Danny, um, you're so inspiring, and you've inspired me and, and obviously all the people that have tried to connect us for the last, you know, several months. Um, and so I'm just thrilled that we could have you on and you could share, you know, your wisdom. I could just give you a few minutes to kind of wrap up, give us some words of inspiration, hope, and kind of where you see the future of our field and hopefully opening the minds, even of some of our colleagues, you know, to kind of maybe approach uh, disease or whatever in a different way. And you've said the word wellness a few times as well. And I wanted you to maybe give us a, a chance to understand that from your perspective. I, I've asked you a few things. So if we go over by a minute or two, I think that's okay. Well, let me just say it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Indu, for, for asking me to be a part of this. And, and my first thing I'd like to say is thank you to all of you, uh, because um, I, I think that I have learned more from people who are living with conditions like many of you are than I, than I have from any textbook or, or, or from any professor. And so I try to be uh, open to the education that you all give me. Uh, I also am open to the inspiration that comes from people who are living with hardship. And I tell people all the time, learn to gain inspiration and energy from the one uh, for whom you are sharing care. My dad inspired me at a time when most of the world would say, poor Lester. Well, you, you know what? He, uh, he lit my fire, I mean, in, in his state of disability. So uh, I would say, let's all look for that part of ourselves that is innate, that is energetic, that is life-giving, that is generative. And, uh, and we need to do that as physicians because I think one of the things we don't do well, uh, and I'm speaking for me too, is, is we don't help live well with the condition. I've heard people with various conditions tell me, the day I got my diag diagnosis was awful because I was given no educational materials. I was given no hope that I was going to go on living with this. I was just told, you know, well, that's the diagnosis and da, da, da. You just, that's terrible. You know, people in the oncology world, they, they get educational materials. You know, they get somebody to help walk them through this. People, we need to do better in neurology. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself too, about helping people to live well, because it's possible to live well with a condition. And, you know, relationships, gratitude, being centered in the moment. Um, there's beauty everywhere and learn what to do with your suffering. Uh, Richard Rohr, who I follow and read, uh, says, if you do not 
know how to, um, he said, if, if you do not know how to transform your pain, you will transmit your pain. And I think that's, that's, that's so true. And so I think transforming the pain through relationships and through spirituality and creativity and, and, and mindfulness and, and, and gratitude, um, I hope that works because I'm, I'm trying it. Okay. And yeah. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's every day is a new lesson. And, uh, every day is, you know, we learn something from our patients and, and I think, uh, apparently on a scale of one to 10, this was a 12 Dr. Potts. So, um, oh, Thank you so <laughs> a much. lot of great comments here. So hopefully, much. um, hopefully Andrea and her gang can share all the beautiful, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, lovely comment, a plus, 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 I, I don't think oh. I've seen these comments. Hey, Guys, we've had like 88 interviews now, and you're this is when you're bringing all the comments. Listen, I'm I'm humbled by that and grateful. And uh, listen, go out and take a photo, go out and draw something, and connect with somebody. It, that's that's it. That's it. Well, thank you so much. I think Indu might have frozen. The internet isn't cooperating today, despite, but we persevered and this really was an amazing hour. Thank you so much. I agree with all of the comments. And we always like to show our gratitude. Um, I invite you to turn your camera on if you've you know, had it off and been behind the scenes. And Dr. Potts, if you scroll through, if you put it in gallery view and scroll through, we just all shave, uh, share a wave of gratitude and a little bit of eye contact across the airwaves here. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for your great questions. And thank you for the inspiration, Dr. Potts. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everybody. Bye now. Bye-bye.